Today's introduction is no easy task, so I've decided to read it as quick bullet points, followed by a personal introduction. Mozu Mustafavi is the Dean of the Harvard Graduate School of Design, the Wiley Professor of Design, formerly the Galen Ira Drukir Dean of the College of Architecture, Art, and Planning at Cornell University, as well as being the Arthur and Isabel Weisenberger Professor in Architecture, previously the Chairman of the Architectural Association School of Architecture, He's been on an infinite number of boards, juries, schools, and has acted as a consultant on many international architectural and urban projects. Yes, if you're wondering, we are still introducing the same person. On to the personal introduction, a poem I wrote for Mosin called Mosin's Fields. A field of architecture we could discuss, although it might garner a lot of architects' distrust. He might detail architecture's past, but he's fully immersed in the current task. Where do these fields exist, you may wonder. Cornell, AA, and Harvard, I must render. There are many other fields that can't be located. Some are metaphorical, theoretical, or politically complicated. But there is one field that's considered a sacred land. It's the one he knows like the back of his hand. For those who don't seek, this area is sealed. Today we have the honor of harvesting Mosin's field. Mosin, thanks for having me at the GSD today. It's an absolute thank pleasure you, to you. sit down thank with you. you. Thank you. So th the first question would be, what do you believe was your first architectural project, whether academical or when you were a student, or what do you feel, b feel the project that you've owned as yours and your first contribution to the discourse? Well, I suppose my first project is something tiny, very modest. It was... Um, a project that involved making uh, quite a few, not just one, quite a few bean bags, yeah. and uh, that happened when I first started uh, architecture school. Before the beginning of the semester, they asked me if I wanted to uh, work, and um, the, the studio that the students were going to uh, be in was basically an empty room with a carpet. And it was called a soft room, and the reason it was called a soft room is because it was going to be not full of hard furniture. And so I um, was left with the fantastic task of uh, building or making, uh, drawing, cutting, welding, you know, gluing, whatever, putting together uh, a lot of bean bags. So um, on the very first day of uh, school, when everybody came, I had made these bean bags that all the other students got to sit. You know, of course, the first thing that happens, half of them start popping, and you get uh, you know mess everywhere and everything. But that that for me is like what I remember as the first thing that I had to think about and make, and some some of it not not very well, but actually see the user. So that's that's my first uh, first project. You have previously said that we can't become pragmatic problem solvers. How do you avoid that notion? We don't avoid uh, doing pragmatic things. I think uh, probably, I don't remember exactly the context of, of that, but if I said that, um, I probably meant it that um, we, we can think of education, we can think of our task purely as something which is technical or pragmatic that um, kind of indispensable part of our practice is are the ideas, are the concepts, are the vision, are the aspirations that we have, and it's the relationship between what we are hoping for and how we make those things into realities uh, that's important. So I, I probably uh, was aspiring to the fact that the duality between the vision, the aspiration, and pragmatism, that combination is something that uh, that's uh, worth fighting for. Can you clarify how you differentiate between style and attitude as ways of approaching architecture? You're going to ask me all these hard questions. <laughs> um, well, style um, is actually defined in different ways. Uh, one way to define style is about the different styles of architecture, the different appearances, and, and these styles also connecting to uh, different moments in, in, uh, in time. There's another way that the word style is used, which has some of those connotations, and it's the way that, for example, Aldo Rossi uses the word style. He says, um, he uses the word style uh, to, to um, mean the articulation, the specificity of a particular manner of doing architecture. 
uh, which is not quite the same as, let's say, when we talk about you know, Edwardian style or Victorian or modernism or things like this. So it's, it has some of those connotations, but I think it also has some other uh, qualities, which is to do with the, with the, with the formation of, of the, the, the specific architecture. Uh, attitude um, is more around a um, certain set of interests, uh, aspirations. It doesn't really specifically, um, uh, for me at least, the way I understand it, it doesn't, it doesn't um, uh, state something very particular about an architectural position. It is just a certain set of uh, conditions, qualities, um, whereas style in this in this Russian sense is something which is very specific, relates to a certain set of traditions, disciplines, and then the outcome has probably some level of recognizability as well. Whereas uh, attitude is uh, is slightly more ambiguous in terms of what its potential outcome could be. You have been the dean at Cornell, the AA, and now GSD. Yes, I promise not to be the dean anywhere else after this. <laughs> How do you define the role of a dean? Well, I think that that um, it's very important for um, the contemporary deans to be both um, uh, thought leaders to be intellectually engaged and at the same time to have the capacity through their um, management, uh, operational capacities and skills uh, to bring about uh, the, um, the academic uh, intellectual vision uh, that is being planned uh, collaboratively, hopefully, with the faculty and the students. For a particular institution, um, uh, today there are there are, um, a lot of situations where the position of the dean is being defined purely in administrative terms, in bureaucratic terms, in financial terms. To me, this is very uninteresting, and I think it's much more exciting if you can really think about the the role or the importance of the role of the dean as someone who is. Um, deeply connected to an intellectual project rather than to an administrative uh, or pragmatic um, project. It's not that different from the first thing that you asked. You know. um, um, yeah. I mean, there's a lot more to say, but I don't know if you want me to say that. No, we can move on to the next one. Architects enjoy knowing what era or style they're operating in, whether it is modernism, postmodernism, contemporary, etc. What part of the spectrum do you believe the current architecture state to be in? Well, we are we are in the we are in the contemporary. <laughs> I mean, I think that that we are always uh, as designers operating within the the, the contemporary uh, milieu. Uh, obviously, um, it was clear that when there was the rise of postmodernism, that uh, people were conscious of the fact that they were operating within this moment of postmodernism. I think that that is gone, or you can say we're still in this postmodern period, but the manifestations are different than the, the, the specific kinds of architecture that we now associate with postmodernism. I think today it's, uh, it's quite good in some sense that we don't have this, that we don't have Postmodernism, for example, as such, even though there are quite a lot of postmodern architects, that we really think about the contemporary project of architecture or um, design, and that we now think about multiple ways, a diverse set of ways in which the response to um, contemporary uh, conditions and challenges could be given shape. And I think that that diversity of approaches is something that's positive rather than. Uh, the singularity of one uh, kind of uh, style. Um, this is why I also favor the definition of style, which is less about whether it's modernism or postmodernism, but the idea of an architecture as style. You seem to hold an extreme importance to historic references. However, you emphasize that we can't use this as a method of applique. How should architects use history? 
Um, there's there are lots of different ways that I think we can think about the use of history. First of all, I think it's 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 important to be knowledgeable about things. Uh, at the same time, we have to be um, aware, and this is why your point about the the avoidance of applique. Um, sometimes you have to be um, to to study things, to be not to be knowledgeable about things, and then to have the capacity to also forget them, in a way. Uh, being too connected with history can also be a problem. In a way, sometimes it's quite good if you don't remember it, in the in the sense of trying to 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 continue it. So the project of history is 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 important in terms of understanding a certain set of conditions, being inspired by them, having the knowledge, understanding of things that have happened before, so that you don't think you're inventing uh, or reinventing the the wheel. Um, but um, but but I think at the same time, um, uh, history by itself is not uh, the, the the necessary precondition for creativity for doing things today. So um, I have this ambivalent relationship that it's it's absolutely important. It is inspiring. It's a key component of being able to construct contemporary uh, arguments in, in in many ways. The awareness of that knowledge. But at the same time, when it comes to um, sitting down and designing or drawing or something like this, I think it's also necessary sometimes to be able to forget. <clears throat> what do you mean when you talk about functionality and its aesthetic consequence? I don't know what I said this and how I said this thing, but I use the, the, the reference to functionality or use um, in terms of our understanding of the role of function in a different way than modernism, for example, used the, the term function, uh, because the term function was used in a very highly objective and instrumental uh, fashion in many instances. And so by using the term uh, use uh, in terms of how we use a dining room or how we use a living room, it puts the emphasis more on the performative dimension, how the room works, how it performs, um, and it opens it up to um, multiple uh, ways of, for example, uh, occupation, rather than trying to limit uh, the, um, the use by being so objective that you reduce it. This is what happened when the whole concept of minimum existence was being defined, and in that sense, the functions were articulated to such an extreme level that they became a kind of limiting. Uh, so um, sometimes you can say, if you are referring to functionality, then <clears throat> function can be a limiting factor. But if you think about function in a more open way, if you think about it as, as use in a more um, innovative way, then actually that also gives you the potential for imagining multiple scenarios, different ways, different kinds of events that can happen. And for a designer, this is a, is a liberating phenomenon because you also have to have the capacity to be able to use uh, function in this, uh, in this more, if you like, scenario building uh, fashion rather than in an objective reductive way. And that's, that's why sometimes you can say, if you are focusing too much on functionality, it has certain uh, limiting consequences in terms of um, design practice. Do you view architecture as a singular discipline that operates in a world of multiplicity, or is it in itself a multiplicity? Um, I don't know what you mean by um, architecture as a singular discipline, I mean, if you mean by architecture as a discipline, uh, then I do think that that it's important for us to um, think about architecture as a, as a discipline with a, with a very specific set of practices and a body of knowledge and things like this. But then at the same time, I think that then this body of knowledge is, is immersed in the world, there, architecture as a discipline is not necessarily, as a body of knowledge, is not necessarily immersed in the world. It becomes immersed in the world through practice. 
And therefore, as soon as the contamination happens between architecture and the well, then it has to be uh, constructed in a multiplicity of different ways, in, in very diverse ways. And so there is a distinction that is necessary to make between architecture as a form of discipline knowledge and architecture as a form of practice. <clears throat> the practice of architecture today needs to be transdisciplinary, it needs to involve multiple disciplines, and it needs to be extremely diverse and varied. But the, the construction of the discipline is in that sense singular, that is architecture as architecture, and then there is the way that architecture work, works in the world. You operate on multiple scales, from the macro to the micro, from the city planning to facade detail. If you had to give architecture a stricter parameter, how would you describe it? Well, architecture does have to work at multiple scales. It does work at multiple scales. And the things that I'm interested in are, a lot of them are the various manifestations of how architecture uh, works uh, in, the, in the world. Um, uh, in terms of um, in terms of contemporary practice, probably one of the positive ways to think about architecture is uh, the creative capacity to be able to think about artifacts that um, construct um, human habitat in the broadest sense. Now, if you take that uh, that kind of way of uh, thinking you will then see that, that as a result of that, it has had its own traditions and its own connections. But it is also something that, that operates at the level of the singular, at the level of the multiple, the multitude, many people, single people. So my interests are mm, very much within the realms of, or within the kind of uh, territories that architecture touches. And there isn't anything terribly uh, unusual about the, 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 the fact that I'm interested in architecture at multiple scales. And I think, uh, for me, this is a very, um, if you like, it's a very cinematic uh, approach because, like the camera, it's at once dealing with close-up. So when I um, have collaborated uh, with others, let's say, on cladding or surface or weathering or things like this, it's really very close to the to the concept of close-up and just looking at something in detail and just only that, not the whole world. But it's possible to zoom in and zoom out and then see, you know, more things happening. And I think a lot of the stuff that's to do with um, with urbanization is also very much to do with this interrelation of kind of people and places and the interaction of user and, uh, and the city, which is not that different from you know, the beanbag and the chair and how somebody sits on the chair. It's, it's all about these kinds of relationships and just the scale of relationships changing. Does the city act as an armature for buildings or do buildings foster cities? Could you clarify whether or not there's a hierarchy that exists between the two? Uh, there's obviously the reciprocity between the two. Um, and... Um, we have gone through um, we've gone through a long period where the city has been seen as a scenographic condition, as a site for architecture. That architecture is the one that makes uh, the city. I think one of the things that is um, uh, that's important, that's exciting about the city, is that in some ways it transcends architecture. Uh, the 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 mess of the city, the people of the city, the, infra the infrastructure of the city, all those things produce a condition or conditions where architecture then becomes a partner, uh, a player, an actor in this particular project, but it doesn't need to be necessarily the sole um, actor. And a lot of times people have tried to make architecture as the only driver, uh, which I, I, I would agree that many, 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 many cities could do with more architecture, with better architecture. But I think it's also important that we visit many cities that don't necessarily have, um, uh, you know, fantastic pieces of architecture, but they are also incredible cities. And there are other things that make that, um, 
the density of places, the way that people live, uh, the customs, the food, um, the whole atmosphere of a city. Uh, sometimes these are the things, you know, there are many other things that make it uh, exciting and vibrant. So I would say the, this is a discussion that's been going on uh, for a long time in terms of the interrelationship between city and architecture. Uh, but uh, it's important to make them codependent, but not um, exactly the, the same. And the disjunction between uh, the city, the scale of the city, the uh, activities of the city and architecture itself, that kind of gap yeah. is actually something that's quite um, exciting. It's quite positive to think about the other stuff that makes the city so, so rich yeah. that can even at times you know, contain a lot of bad architecture, but still be a great city. Going back to the cinema reference, and using film as an example, you talk about the role of the figure in architecture, not as a form, but as a relational object. Is that, way, is that a way of saying that architecture is not autonomous? No, I want to have my cake and eat it, you know. <laughs> I, I, uh, I think that, that, uh, that I believe, uh, this is why we were discussing earlier about the idea of architecture as architecture, but architecture as something that also operates within a, within a broader context when it's spatialized, when it's practiced. So um, there is a difference between, um, um, between the, 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 the architecture and architecture's autonomy which relates to its dis to discipline knowledge, um, but there is also uh, the way in which the user, in a way, practices architecture, and there's and 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 the, the figure becomes obviously an important part of the, the the moment in which the architecture is like a child that is, you know, in the world. They have their kind of uh, their own independence and so on. I think that that relationship between architecture and the figure is absolutely critical because that's the liberative moment of architecture when architecture, this room, can be used in multiple different ways by different people and the figure, the user, has the capacity to rewrite the scenography, to rewrite the, the, the scenario, the story of the room, the story of, of architecture and I think that that's, that's, an ex that's a very exciting thing for architects to not be seeing architecture only in terms of its controlling dimension, but actually more in terms of its emancipatory, in terms of its the way that it opens up, the way that it provides a variety of different um, types of activities and events that can, that can happen. You've shifted the conversation about landscape into a new realm of ecological urbanism. Could you take us through the reason for that? Well, I think it's very important to say that I, 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 I love landscape architecture and I think that there's an incredible uh, tradition and history of, uh, of, of landscape, which actually needs to be, um, we need to invest more in that. I think we need to spend more time thinking about what, what contemporary landscape architecture um, means, but that maybe that's for another day. I think well, part of my interest in the discussion of ecological urbanism has been to say that today we need uh, new ways, alternative ways, different ways that uh, are in tune with our contemporary conditions uh, as a way of redefining what urban design or urban, urban urbanization could be as a, as a project. I think that the, um, the traditions that we have inherited from modernism or other ways of dealing with planning are by themselves no longer sufficient to deal with uh, the contemporary realities of, of urbanization. So um, ecological urbanism is simply one of the ways in which it may be possible to think through the lens of, of ecology and the, the whole question of its relationship to urbanization to very different conditions, urbanization and ecology, by bringing them together that one can really think about um, <clears throat> ways in which um, there would be a different mindset, a different kind of framework that can be in, in place at the intersection of ecology and urbanization. Now, this is not to question in any form or fashion the role of landscape, mm -hmm. but to actually bring this, this 
discussion to, to another level, which I think for me has been a very important part of also linking urban design to questions of democracy, to questions of resources, to the quality of life kind of issues, and so on and so forth, all through this lens of, of um, what are the, what is the material that we use, what are the material, what are the resources that we have, and so on and so forth. What causes the separation between pedagogy and research, and why is it important to combine the two? Um, I don't know that there is some... Um, Well, there doesn't need to be so much of a division between pedagogy and research. I think partly um, uh, what's happened in a lot of uh, academic contexts is that, that we didn't really know what research meant in terms of design or when you're working through design. So I think people within the academy have had very... Um, ways of, of traditional forms of scholarship, for example, scholarship related to the writing of history, scholarship related to investigations in technology, and so on. But it, when, it's, when it comes to the history of sort of design, there's been less of that uh, in the sense of what does it mean when you say you're doing research through practice or through design. Um, therefore, the, the, the Design Academy, the Architectural Academy, has been very much um, traditionally kind of um, practice focus, which makes it kind of um, very much knowledge based. But at times it doesn't really open it up to questions that can be um, explored within through the discipline. Um, and um, I think in the in the best uh, situations, pedagogy itself is a form of research because you are combining knowledge that you have with the way in which the studio or the, the project is set up in order to also instigate the production of new forms of knowledge. I think um, this is what I feel is very important and necessary within um, academia uh, today. And it's, it's you know, partly to do with the organizational structure, how these things have been separated. Now it's really important to uh, bring them together uh, in part, as I said, because we want to construct new forms of knowledge. But also, I think that the way that we've been practicing, it's been um, separating us uh, from a whole host of other disciplines, other forms of, of knowledge construction. And in order to be able to connect uh, with other disciplines, uh, we need now to also be operating in a way that moves us forward with them, so we need to construct new forms of collaboration. These new forms of collaboration are necessary in order to be able to respond to a whole host of issues that we face today. So, for example, we now have uh, significant issues to do with um, the future of urbanization and health. There are many, many cities. Think about Beijing. Uh, you know, um, there are many cities like that where the the the, the, the scale of pollution is so phenomenal that the, the, the health of the citizens is really, really um, under incredible threat. Now, you can't just think about the expertise of planning or urbanization without now also thinking about its health consequences. Therefore, uh, traditional master planning doesn't do it anymore. So you need the expertise between public health professionals, uh, designers, transportation experts, all these kinds of people to come together to be able to think about how you can make cities healthy. This kind of research, this sort of investigation it would, in the past would have been not so much linked to, let's say, design schools or architecture schools. And we're now finding that we need to connect in different ways with engineers, with the medical schools, with public health schools, with business schools, um, a school of government and so on and so forth and this is you know one of the ways in which we can, we are trying to also reap the benefits of being at uh, Harvard just simply because of these connections that are possible to have in relation to questions of, of governance or questions of, of health and so on 
by linking with other professional schools. This is really where the future of education is. This is where the future of our um, discipline is, because if we're going to also make ourselves more valuable than we have been in the recent past, we will need to create things that really matter differently to people. Uh, since I think in the in the recent past, we have become, in a way, kind of service professionals that have not been uh, big thinkers. And I think it's important for, for, for our schools to really produce people who, who have the capacity to really think in different ways to, uh, to transform uh, the environment and really to create uh, better futures. And that can only happen when there is really the possibility of, of, for the construction of new forms of knowledge. In terms of politics of branding architecture, do you find it something that needs to exist, or is it a dangerous territory? Well, you know, that people always have a um, reaction to the word branding, and I don't know that that's the right word. Um, I think it probably, if you're talking about the fact that um, architecture needs to have the capacity to um, construct particular identities, particular situations and to be able to um, communicate the value of those situations, then I think it's it's really important for us to have the capacity to be able to do that. I don't know that that's branding. Uh, for example, if I say to you that um, health and urbanization is a big issue, I could make healthy cities a brand, uh, but at the same time, I could also, we could also discuss the value of the reconsideration of the relationship between health and urbanization as, as a territory for investigation, which we can also communicate to, to others if people are interested in the future of cities and so on and so forth. That is also a necessary, um, uh, necessary, um, it's necessary for us to have, to be able to let people know about our discoveries and the value of our discoveries, and you could call that a brand, but but I, but I think it's 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 probably a less contentious to think about it in, in, in terms that relate more to um, the, the the value of constructing important themes, issues that have relevance for society today. Let's, on, let's end on this question. Architecture is a complex thing with many architects attempting to simplify it to a process or a technique. Is that beneficial or detrimental to the field? Um, I think it's very important for people within architecture to be doing lots of different things of different sorts at multiple scales. So if there are there there within architecture. We always need people who um, develop certain types of specialization. It is through those specializations that some that sometimes we push uh, the um, the expansion of of knowledge. If, however, you have focused on something extremely narrow, and then you use that in order to apply it to a much wider, larger condition, uh, that may create uh, problems. So um, this, I think, is, is, is an important question because I don't know that the word simple is the right word. Sometimes people focus on, uh, let's say, a very specific area, parametricism. It can be something that is very specific and you could probably develop uh, a very crucial set of, uh, of ideas, uh, develop an extraordinary body of knowledge, and, and that knowledge is necessary. It becomes part of um, the discipline of knowledge that we have. The application of that knowledge, however, needs to be thought of completely differently than simply a one-to-one -one translation from development of ideas. So, um, so we need to be open to, uh, to focused work, to more specific work, and so on. 
um, but we need to be also wary at the oversimplified application of ideas that we need multiple filters, multiple conditions, multiple stages of discussion and so on. We also need to be um, uh, clear that architecture is a situated, is a social project. At the same time, not every architectural investigation needs to be thought of as a social act from day one. So if we're investigating something, there is enormous value in abstraction, in formal conditions that we are exploring. Um, but I think it's the, the manner in which the formal becomes um, spatialized, the formal becomes um, socialized, situated, that is so critical and so important uh, today, uh, especially when architecture has um, a diversity of users, a diversity of, of audiences, and therefore how we fulfill our responsibility to these audiences, that is to society, and at the same time stay true to the task of architectural production, to the quality of architecture, to the ex excellence of, of, of architecture, that is really the, the, the very, very, very difficult task that we face today. It's not every day you get to sit down with someone who's contributed so much to the protection and growth of the architecture discourse. I have no words to describe my gratitude. So a thank you will have to suffice. So thank you so much for a great conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.